Here is a nice integral, and by nice I mean it seems hostile at first glance, but it turns out to have a really elegant solution development. And the solution development here involves my favorite integration technique, I'm talking about Feynman's approach of differentiating under the integral sign. So we're going to call our integral i, and we're going to define an integral function i of some parameter a. And where exactly do we place this parameter? Well, a sensible choice here would be as part of the argument of the sine function. So we have e to the negative x squared times the sine of ax squared divided by x squared dx. And the reason I'm calling it sensible is because if you differentiate partially with respect to a, the sine of ax squared, you get uh, the derivative of the sine function is the cosine function. So you have cosine ax squared. And because of the chain rule, uh, the derivative of a with respect to a is 1. And x squared is just a constant multiple because we're taking the partial derivative. So we have this extra factor of x squared, which will cancel out with the denominator quite nicely. So yeah, this is a good choice. So as per the approach, we're going to differentiate the integral function with respect to the parameter a. And the golden question here is, can we perform the switch up of the integration and the differentiation operators? Well, if you look at the integrand, well, it consists of a Gaussian term here, e to the negative x squared. And we have a bounded sine function. And all of this is being divided by x squared, which is an increasing function on this interval. So we're dividing by an increasing function. Or we can say that we're multiplying by the decreasing function 1 by x squared. So yeah, on this interval, there are no problems regarding convergence or boundedness. So yes, indeed, we can perform the switch up. And because of the switch up, the total derivative with respect to a becomes a partial one. So we're differentiating partially with respect to a, e to the negative x squared times the sine of a x squared divided by x squared. And we're carrying out the integration with respect to x. Because we're differentiating partially with respect to a, the x terms here are constants. So we have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared divided by x squared times the derivative of the sine function, which is the cosine function. So we have cosine ax squared. And because of, because of the chain rule, we need the derivative of the argument, which sorts out, in this case, to x squared. And this multiple of x squared cancels out quite nicely with our denominator here. So this implies the derivative of i with respect to a is the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the cosine of ax squared dx. Next up, we're going to make use of Euler's wonderful formula, whereby we know that e to the ix equals the cosine of x plus i times the sine of x. And notice that our integrand contains the cosine term. So we're only interested in the real part of this complex exponential. So if we need cosine ax squared, then this means that we need the real part of e to the i a x squared. OK, cool. So all of this implies that the derivative of i with respect to a is the real part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times e to the i a x squared dx. So multiplying out these two exponentials, you're left with the real part of the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the, I'm going to factor out a negative x squared term here. So that leaves me with 1 minus i times a. And what exactly is the structure that you've uh, that you've finally obtained after all of this awesome mathematics. So you'll be quite happy to know that this integral is just an example of a generalized, a sort of generalized Gaussian integral, where if you have the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative sx squared dx, where s is a complex number with a non-negative real part. And in this case, we do have a non-negative real part. We have a real part equal to 1. So anyway, this integral sorts out to 1 half 
of the square root of pi by s. So that means we have a pretty nice structure for i prime. We have i prime of a being equal to uh, this factor of one half, then this factor of square root pi times the real part of the reciprocal of the square root of your complex number, which in this case is just one minus i times a. And we can write this as uh, half the square root of pi times the real part of one minus i times a to the negative one half. And now that we have the derivative of i with respect to a, completely in terms of the parameter a alone, we can proceed to recover our integral function i from its derivative by integrating with respect to a. So on the right hand side, you have square root pi by two times the real part of the integral of one minus i times a to the negative one half dA. So this implies that on the left hand side you have i of a being equal to the square root of pi by two times the real part of one minus i times a to the negative one half plus one is just one half, right? And downstairs again you have this one half factor and you have to divide by the derivative of one minus i times a with respect to a, right? Which is just a uh, negative i, the imaginary unit. Okay, cool, so we're dividing by negative i and we have this constant of integration that we're gonna deal with later as well. Okay, so finally we have i of a being equal to square root pi by two and wait a second, these factors cancel out quite nicely once again. So we have square root pi times the real part of one minus i times a, the square root of that, divided by negative i. Now the good news is we know that uh, one by i equals negative i, which is just awesome. I mean, I think this this little equation here is just incredibly beautiful and Another one of the many, many, many reasons to love complex analysis. So we know this, so we can write negative i, the reciprocal of negative i as just plain old i. So we need the real part of i times the square root of one minus i times a, and we have this constant of integration as well. So how exactly do we figure out the value of the constant of integration? Well, recall that your integral function i of a was defined as the integral from zero to infinity of e to the negative x squared times the sine of a x squared divided by x squared. So if you plug in a equal to zero, then that means that upstairs you have sine of zero, which is zero. So the entire integrand collapses to zero, giving you i of zero being equal to zero. So that's a pretty useful piece of information. So using a equals zero, we have zero equal to the square root of pi times the real part of i times the square root of one minus zero, which is one anyway, plus the constant of integration that we're looking for. And the real part of i is zero anyway, so this implies that your constant of integration is conveniently zero. Okay, cool. So that means we can finally turn our attention to our target case. And our target case is that of a being equal to one. So this implies that your target integral, which is i of one, equals the square root of pi times the real part of i times the square root of one minus i times a. And a in our target case is just one. So we're now interested in the real part of this complex number, which is quite easy to extract. All we have to do is use the polar representation of complex numbers. So let z be the complex number one minus i. And in the polar form, for that you need the uh, modulus of z, which in this case is the square root of two, and the argument of z. And remember, we're only interested in the principal branch. So here we have the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, which is negative one, divided by the real part, which is one, which sorts out to negative pi by four. So that means in the polar form, 
you have z equal to 1 minus i equal to the square root of 2 times e to the negative i times pi by 4. And we're interested in the square root of 1 minus i, and the square root is just an exponent of uh, 1 half, right? So this implies that the square root of 1 minus i equals the square root of the square root of 2 times e to the negative i pi by 8 now. And again, we're interested in multiplying the square root term by the imaginary unit i. So carrying out this multiplication and once again expanding the complex exponential using Euler's wonderful formula, we have the square root of, uh, we have i times the square root of the square root of 2 times the cosine of negative pi by 8 is the same as the cosine of pi by 8 because the cosine is an even function. On the contrary, the sine is an odd function, so the negative sign just pops out. So you have um, minus i times sine pi by 8. And multiplying out this i term here, that gives you i times the cosine term and i squared times the sine term. Now negative i squared is just positive 1. Okay, cool. So finally we have i times the square root of 1 minus i. And we need the real part of this. And that is pretty clear that that is the square root of the square root of 2 times the sine of pi by 8. Okay, nice. This is awesome. So all we needed was this real part times the square root of pi, and that gives you your target integral i. So finally, we can write here that the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative x squared times sine x squared divided by x squared dx equals the square root of pi times the square root of 2 times the sine of pi by 8. A really nice result indeed. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.